Um, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I was uh, talking to a, actually an Irish uh, parish priest, and he was uh, a very good priest, very devoted, dedicated, and he was uh, telling me about some financial problems his parish is having, and uh, the roof is uh, in need of major repairs. And not the first time we've heard of that, I'm sure. But I uh, listened to him talk about his plans and his anxiety about, about raising the money for the renovations to the church because the level of participation in the parish has been going down quite steadily. And also that um, you know, the numbers are going down. So as he spoke, and it, it sounded, he was, he was rather heavy-hearted. He was, he was responding uh, loyally and faithfully and, and generously to the needs of his local church. But as I listened to him, I, I thought there must be another way of approaching this, one that's more joyful and maybe more creative. So in the conversation that followed, I suggested to him, I said, why don't you, instead of just thinking about putting a new roof on the church, why don't you think about what is the purpose of the church in this particular part of the country? How does it serve the spiritual needs of all the people around, not just the people who come, the diminishing number of people who come regularly to the church, but the whole population here? And there's quite a lot of spiritual and cultural life in that area. And I said, why not think of a church building that would certainly have a sacramental life, a Eucharistic life at its heart, at its core, in a sacred space, but would also be a place where you could have a counseling service, you could have an interfaith uh, room or center, you could have a cultural artistic center, responding to the the different spiritual aspects, and as I'll suggest later, different forms of prayer that are being practiced or, or sought by the, the, the people in general living around. And as I spoke about this, I kind of warmed to the subject, a little bit um, maybe too creative, and uh, I suddenly noticed that he had a very glazed look in his eye. <laughs> So I wasn't expecting any great revolutionary <laughs> changes in the church renovation fund. But uh, it's wonderful to be here in this diocese, uh, which I've heard about before, and in speaking with uh, particularly members of the, of, the, of the lay leadership here, uh, to see that uh, there is a, a thinking going on here, a creative thinking about the church of the future, uh, we know that the church of the past is past. We know that we are in transition. We don't know exactly where we're going to go. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said shortly before he was executed uh, by the Nazis in 1945, he said, uh, to be a disciple of Jesus uh, means that you follow the call. You don't know where you're going to be led but you do know that it will be a way of joy because that is what discipleship of the Lord is about. And I felt even in my short time conversation here with uh, some of the leadership in the diocese that uh, there is a uh, fresh and open uh, reflection and uh, here which uh, I'm sure will bear fruit and I hope what I can share with you this evening will be a small contribution to that, as it has already inspired me. So I'd like to talk and reflect with you uh, this evening about prayer, and about how prayer makes or breaks the church. The way we pray is the way we live. If we pray superficially, we live superficially. If we make no time for prayer, no space in ourselves for prayer, then we will feel more and more empty and lost. 
If we could even imagine a church without prayer, what kind of church would it be? A church without prayer. It's a very horrible thought. It would be an institution without heart, without love. It would be a power structure concerned only with its own survival and its own internal competition and rivalries. It would be built on fear and even on cruelty rather than on forgiveness and compassion. It would be a church that sees itself in terms of membership rather than discipleship, of domination rather than service. So a church without prayer is really unthinkable, horrible. That call to follow, which is at the heart of Christian life, is a call that we hear at the beginning of the Gospel of John, where Jesus makes his first appearance. You remember that John the Baptist is standing with some of his disciples when Jesus passes by. John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, There is the Lamb of God. The two disciples follow Jesus. Jesus turns and sees them following him. And he asks them, what are you looking for? And they reply, teacher, where are you staying? And he says, come and see. And they go and see where he is staying and they spend the rest of the day with him. These are the first words of Jesus in the Gospel of John. A question, what are you looking for? They anticipate the words of Jesus at the end of the Gospel, which we will be hearing during the Easter um, Gospel readings. And he says to Mary of Magdala in the garden, the resurrection, who are you looking for when she thinks that he is the gardener? So this uh, very short, simple little opening introduction to Jesus is uh, filled with great uh, richness of meaning. And it's a piece of scripture that forms and informs us about what I'd like to talk about this evening. First of all, we've all had John the Baptists in our lives, people who have pointed out Jesus to us. Maybe in the classroom when we were very young, or our grandparents, or our parents, or teachers, or friends, or books we've read. And we have, I'm sure all of us here, at some point, begun to follow. We don't quite know what following Jesus means except keeping the rules. That's how we were taught at first. These are the rules of being a disciple. Follow the rules and you are being a good Christian. But then a very important moment comes, a turning point where Jesus turns, looks at them and sees them following him and they see that they are seen. What does that mean? It's the beginning of a relationship. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, recently who has a daughter about, I think about 14 years old who uh, is at school, of course, and I said to him, how is uh, Georgina? And he said, oh, she's fine, she's in love. <laughs> so I said, that's great. I said, who is she in love with? And he said, oh, a boy at school. And she has no eyes except for this boy and uh, can't think or talk about anything else. So I said, that's a beautiful moment in her life. I said, what about the boy? So he said, oh, he doesn't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope at some point or other, he will turn and see her eyes following him. 
and she will see that he sees, and let's hope that it's all happy ever after. So this is a moment where a relationship really begins, where there is eye contact and where there is a, a personal, a mutual recognition. And Jesus uh, opens this new stage in their relationship. They're no longer just following him by keeping the rules, looking at the back of his head. They are now facing him, face to face. This is the beginning of Christian maturity. And he asks them a question, what are you looking for? A very profound and simple question. So what are we looking for? At what level do we even hear that question? And how does that question change us as we listen? And they reply, already recognizing him as their teacher, Teacher, they say, where are you staying? So they reply with another question. But this word staying in the Gospel of John also anticipates another use of the word in the farewell discourses at the Last Supper, where Jesus speaks about the Father staying or dwelling in him, and he staying or dwelling in the Father. So there is a whole deeper mystical dimension to this very simple exchange. Where are you staying? Might sound like, you know, what's your address? But it also carries with it the suggestion of a deeper uh, relationship, a deeper union, a deeper presence to each other. And Jesus replies to their question, not with information, he doesn't say, you know, I'll give you my email and uh, these are my visiting hours. But he replies with an invitation, come and see. And that is the Christian life. Coming and seeing where he is staying <coughs> with him. He doesn't say, go and look in my house. I won't be there, but you can have a look around. He says, come with me and see and spend some time with me. They accept that invitation and they spend the rest of the day, symbolically you might say the rest of their lives, with him. And then uh, St. John ends by saying it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Which means what? What's the importance of that? Mm. Tea time? Or the fact that it's a prayer time. The early Christians punctuated the day, uh, every day, as one does in monastic life, with uh, times of prayer, as we do with the Liturgy of the Hours, which is the prayer not just of monks and nuns, my sisters here from Clyde Moore, but of the whole church. So the idea of punctuating the day with specific periods of prayer is suggested by this little detail. And it suggests, too, that at this moment of prayer, the encounter happens. And everything that flows from it is, happens within this experience of prayer. So, what do we mean by prayer? How do we understand it? I think the way we think of prayer is the way we think of the church as well as the way we understand the meaning of our own lives. Think of the priest I mentioned at the beginning, who's struggling with his church building. The way he thinks of that church building is going to be shaped by the way he thinks of prayer. If he thinks of the church, if he thinks of prayer only in terms of the provision of sacramental services, then his thinking about the church is going to be conditioned by that, isn't it? If he thinks of prayer in the sort of slightly wider way that I was suggesting to him, he might think of the building in a very different way, and get a different kind of architect in to work with him. We know from the Catechism what prayer is, the raising of the mind and heart to God. 
beautiful, succinct, typically Roman definition. Very succinct, very to the point, and, and very comprehensive. The raising of the mind and heart to God. Couldn't do better than that. But it depends a lot on what we understand by heart. The heart is not the organ of emotion or of feeling in this kind of use, usage. The heart is a symbol of the deep center of the human being. It is the seat of wisdom. It is our mysterious core identity which proceeds mysteriously from the divine act of creation. This is where we begin to come into existence, where we begin to ask, who am I? It is from here that we listen to this question, what are you looking for? So the heart is this deep center of intelligence and consciousness you can't measure by IQ or by exams, but it's a place of awakening and an integrated center of the human person. It's a symbol of the whole person. I speak from the heart, we say, or I put my heart into it. It means that it, it reflects my integrity and my wholeness. If I speak from the heart, it means you can trust me. So how do we bring the mind and the heart together so that they both rise to God, the raising of the mind and heart to God? The church faces many challenges today, not only its sinfulness, not only its bad choices, not only its uh, number, the problem of numbers, or its problem of manpower, but also the very connection it has with the world around it. What is its connection to contemporary society? to the modern world and the modern mind. Clearly something has gone wrong or something is not working very well with this connection. What is the connection with the spiritual needs and the spiritual quest of contemporary society? In a world, a secular world. But a secular world doesn't mean a world that has rejected religion. A secular world is simply a world that doesn't give religion any special privileges. Just because you're religious, just because you're wearing a religious habit, just because you're a religious profession or whatever, doesn't mean that you, you should be treated in any special way. Or that, that your opinions necessarily have priority over other people's opinions. And that in a secular society, people are free free to choose, to believe or not to believe, to practice or not to practice, to change their religion or to rediscover their religion. We're free to do that in a secular society. So how does the church relate to this new form of society that was almost inconceivable before, and yet, as many scholars would say, a secular society which the church itself has prepared for. The secular society is in many ways what the church has been preparing for and has contributed to, even if it didn't know what it was doing. So how does the church relate to this new kind of society? To talk about prayer is to begin to see how we can do that how we can meet the challenges of our time. 
how we know what to do with the roof of the church, where to spend our money, where to spend our time, and above all, how to use our human resources and the immense energy and passionate commitment of faith that is there in the church, the true vocations waiting to be released. I think the way we understand prayer is going to decide whether or not we, we do that and how we do it. <laughs>